So this is going to be a short overview of the education topic for A-Level Sociology Paper 1. Now this will be either for you to use as revision once you've covered a topic or if you want to go through this now as a, as a brief introduction of what you may be uh, coming across as you study the unit. So what we're going to cover in this short summary. So we're going to look at the exam paper briefly just to think about what's going on there. We'll talk about what we need to know in terms of relation to the spec, what the spec tells us we need to cover. We're going to overview some of the key topics. There are only five key topics in education. So we'll also think about some of the key thinkers. And then we'll go into some of these topic areas very briefly just to review them. So what does the specification say? Now, the specification doesn't have much in it. As you can see on the screen, these are the key elements that come up in the specification. We need to know the role and the function of education systems and their relationship to the economy and class. We need to talk about differentiation in educational achievement between social groups in terms of class, gender and ethnicity. We also need to review relationships and processes within schools with particular reference to teacher pupil relationships, pupil identity, subculture, hidden curriculum and the organisation of teaching and the significance of educational policy and particularly selection policies, marketization, privatization, uh, and anything that impacts on equality. So whether that's to do with class, gender, or ethnicity. So this is what the specification tells us. And as you can see, it's, it's not a, a very thorough description of what needs to be reviewed. So we have broken down into loads of different topics. And what I will do is discuss some of those right now. So what we will cover and what we will look at is social policy, as a topic, we'll look at sociological theories of education. So the core sociology theories, functionalism, Marxism, feminism, interactions and postmodernism and new right. And then we'll go into the DEAs, the differential educational attainment or differential educational achievement. So basically, why do and what are the, the achievement differences in terms of social class, ethnicity and gender? And we're looking at within that group, so generally within classes, Rich and poor with ethnicity is minority and majority and with gender is boys and girls. So what is causing a difference in achievement? What's causing the gap? And we're going to look at what's happening inside the education system, the internal and what's happening outside the external. So as an overview, if you think about this topic, we've got policy, all the theory and the DEAs. Now, one of the big things about sociology is a very synoptic topic and a very synoptic course. So the policy will have a connection to the DEAs, gender, ethnicity and class. We might find connections between functionalism and new right and they share similar views on the working of education. Marxism will have connections to class and DEA, feminism with gender and DEA. We'll look at interactionism, which has connections with all the DEAs because it's all about what's happening inside school. Postmodernism will have a connection with some of these differential achievements, particularly in terms of stuff like gender and changes in um, identity and sense of self. New Right will have views on social policy, it has its connections to functionalism. It disagrees with Marxist and feminist approaches uh, and all these different topics connect to one another. And as you can see, it becomes a bit of a mess. So it becomes quite tricky. So one of the things to think about with this course is that you need to think about these topics like COGS. They're all working together. They're all connecting, rotating, moving, and they're all connected to each other. So you can draw on other topics throughout the course. So just as a little recap starter. Now, if you are overviewing the course and you haven't studied yet, don't panic about trying to have a go at these. If you've done sociology, if you've done the education topic, pause the video, take a look at these definitions and think, can you define them? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click straight onto the answers so you can pause it and have a think. And here are your answers. So these are the, some just a selection of definitions and key definitions, particularly ones that tend to be forgotten or or kind of don't always sort of come to the forefront of your mind because they're slightly obscure or they're not often uh, used as frequently in terms of some of the other sort of definitions we might refer to throughout the course. So just a few sort of definitions that people tend to find slightly tricky. Now, key thinkers. How many key thinkers can you remember? So just as before, I'm going to put a little mind map on the screen. You can pause it. You can take some time, as much time as you need 
to think about all the thinkers from sociology if you've studied the topic. If this is your first time and you're just getting an overview of education, don't feel you have to take part in this because you won't necessarily have the key thinkers. But what you might see is a lot of these key thinkers are people we you may have studied in other topics like in family or, or beliefs or crime, whatever order you've done it, you may have seen some of these names before. So if you've done sociology before, uh, obviously ignore the reference to a revision pack. Um, but again, have a go. Can you think of as many thinkers, theorists from education? Pause the video, take your time, and I'm going to click straight on to just a selection of key thinkers. Here we go. So these are just a handful. I say a handful, there's quite a lot there. But these are some of the key thinkers from the education topic. And you see there's a lot of key names here. They're always called the core thinkers, the ones who are always within sociology. So, you know, Durkheim, your Parsons, uh, your Outers there. Um, you know, some of these key thinkers are, are fairly familiar names. They're always popping up. But as I say, uh, these are sort of selection of some of the key thinkers from this topic. Now, you might be saying there's too much to learn. There's too many thinkers. There's too many concepts. And what I would say is, you know, you don't need to know every single person. You do not need to know every single thinker, every single individual pairing. There are, you know, in sociology of education, there's over 70 sociologists alone. There's over 100 concepts. You do not need to know every single one of them. What I would suggest is, you know, you need a handful, maybe three or four per topic area. You know, imagine if you're writing an essay, you need at least one sociologist per paragraph in a 20 or a 10 marker. So, again, you don't need to know every single name, but I'd say choose a handful to use and include in each topic and try and learn them fairly well. So, you know what they said and what they thought and how their theory fits in with the topic. Now, the papers themselves. Now, as we said, there's five kind of top areas: policy, theory, class and DA, um, ethnicity and DA, gender and DA. And looking at past papers, so as you can see on the screen, we've got the 2016 paper. You know, the questions you, you're facing exam is a four, a six, a 10 and a 30. And the questions can pull from any part of this course. So you can see in this 2016 specimen, there's obviously a bit of class, there's some policy, there's uh, the 10 mark, which is a DEA question, so it does pull on a bit of gender, ethnicity and class. And then there's the theory 30 marker. In 2017, um, very similar, sort of similar-ish pattern. So for the four marker, it's looking at marketization. So it's got a bit of policy, it's got a bit of class. The six marker is all about gender. The, um, uh, the 10 marker there is a theory one and then the 30 marker is a class essay again. So you've got two class essays on there, but it's also, I've kind of put it, it's not pure orange or pure, pure yellow because it's a combination of theory and class and DEA. 2018, a similar story. So we've got some ethnicity questions for the four, gender for the six, 10 markers, a bit of policy and class com uh, combined together and theory question for the 30. So, if we go straight into our first topic area, post uh, policy, policy, social policy. So on the screen, you've got this little mind map and there's a bit of a timeline, really, sorry, not a mind map, of key policies, key periods of time. And I've also tried to put on here, as you can see along the timeline, the red and blue indicating political change. So from Labour to Conservative. Um, it's not completely detailed. It doesn't cover every single policy, but it does highlight some of the core policies, the most influential policies that have affected education. Now, the big orange line here is the one I want you to sort of just think about, is that you could be, for example, in some questions, be given a, a time scale to consider, so over the past 50 years. Now, that could mean that you, can, you can't really use policies beyond a certain period of time. So the last 50 years would take us to 1970. You could probably just about maybe stretch it to get some policies from 1965 in, but that would probably be it. So 1970 onwards, you probably have to focus on those. So again, if you want to pause that screen and make some notes, you're more, uh, more than welcome to do that. Now, these slides here, these come from the Pearson's revision book for sociology. Um, and I will put a link 
just sort of to Amazon or something for that in this uh, description. But one of the things that I thought is just worth flagging up this page is it when we talk about social policy, we talk about big political change and how that affects education. But we also need to think about how it affects its social class, how it can affect gender, how it can affect ethnicity. And also, not every policy has to be bad. So there are policies which are really positive for social class and policies which are quite negative. So particularly a lot of the new Labour policies between 97 and uh, sort of 2010 ish were really quite beneficial for working class or lower income students. But then by contrast, as you can see, a lot of the policies that came in um, in the sort of 90, sorry, 79 to 97 sort of conservative uh, rule. And then since 2010, a lot of the positive policies have been removed and revoked. Uh, similar story in terms of ethnicity and gender there. So again, it's just worth recognising when we talk about policies, also building those connections to those core um, sort of variables like class, gender and ethnicity. Now, other key policies, again, the core policies that always sort of are worth knowing and using would be EMA, Sure Start, Aim Higher, but which are all introduced under New Labour and were all subsequently cut when the Conservative Lib Dem coalition came into uh, power. Tuition fees increasing, uh, so particularly the triple tripling of the fees under the um, the Conservatives, but also recognising that under New Labour there was an increase in tuition fees. So tuition, tuition, fee, tuition fees went up under New Labour. Uh, you've got Chist and Wise, Prevent, Cuts to Education and Raising Boys Achievement. These are all strategies that have been introduced under policy. And just as some specific policy questions, again, you can pause these and take a look at those in your own time. Um, these are other some other questions that have been taken from a textbook. So again, could be worth you reviewing if you want. So here we get into the theory of education. So I'm going to fly through the key theories, just as I said, as either a recap or an overview introduction. So some of these tasks you can take in your own time. You can take a screenshot or print this out or, or just do it on paper. So functionalism as a key theory. Now, the organisation of functionalism, they talk about how the education system has a number of responsibilities. So preparation of children to fit wider society. So making us fit in society, part of that socialisation process, transmitting specialist skills that we need to be employed and also to encourage cooperation, integration and social solidarity. So these are the key values that functionalists hold of the education system. And for them, the education system is a positive thing. It is good. It's essential. We need it. So it's a very positive view of education. Now, functionalists, the key ones we have would be Durkheim, as you can see here. We've got Parsons and we've got Davidson Moore. Now, Durkheim talked about how the education system had two specialist functions. It was teaching us specialist skills and integrating us into society, reinforcing social solidarity of norms, values and beliefs. Parsons talks about uh, the says secondary socialisation process. So education taught universalistic values. It acted as a bridge between the family and society. It was meritocratic and it was a society in miniature. And then Davis and Moore talked about education performing the roles of sifting and sorting, role allocation, preparing students for, again, wider society to be a productive member of society. And so we would benefit society as a whole, putting us in the right job to maximise our contributions to society. In a similar vein to functionalism, the new rights share this view that the education system is beneficial for society. It's about securing stability and one that would come from sharing norms of values, teaching traditional values through the curriculum and ultimately teaching is important for us and for the wider economy. So schools are responsible for their success and their failure. So this is pushing towards marketization. Schools that succeed will do very well. Schools that underperform will eventually potentially close. Their view of the education system is quite critical 
uh, under the sense they believe the education system is failing to do its job. Society is failing to benefit wider society and the economy. And so the suggestions and the ideas they bring in would be stuff like consumer choice, marketization, uh, to improve the way the education system works. As a throw to policy, we've also got stuff like the Education Reform Act, which was introduced uh, in the uh, well, 1988 by the Conservatives. And again, that radically changed the education system. Key thinkers for New Right, we've got Chubba Mo, who highlight the benefits of marketization and why it should be introduced to improve school standards, as well as generally throwing in the Conservative policies. So the Conservative policies talk about Conservatives and the New Right a lot because over the past 50 years, they have been in power for 30 of them. So what that means is that any policies that have been introduced, whether they have benefited or disadvantaged education, a lot of these policies obviously have influenced all aspects of society. So we should obviously look at what they have introduced and what they potentially will introduce in the future. Now, Marxism, again, has a critical view of the education system, but for different reasons. So Marxists are critical of education because it is a tool of reproducing capitalist values and ideologies and ensuring the survival of capitalism. So really sort of thrown into theorists like Althusser, um, who say the education system promotes the core values of, um, sort of greed, supporting capitalism, following instructions, doing what you're told. So it's all about this reproduction and legitimation of capitalist ideologies. So ultimately, Marxists are critical of education, not because of what education does or what it is doing, or what it's not doing, but the wider role it plays in supporting capitalism. So again, very critical of education. The key Marxist thinkers we have, there's quite a few of them here. So we have Bells and Gintis who talk about the myth of meritocracy. We're told that we are all equal, treated fairly, we can all achieve, and that's not the case. Willis talks about learning the labor. So it's a, sort of an interactionist approach to studying working class lads and obviously their expectations and their opportunities. Althusser talks about ideological state apparatus or ISAs and in Bourdieu. And Bourdieu is really good because he talks about cultural capital, talks about habitus, and he has a lot of connections to DEA and class, which you'll see later. Now, feminism, as you can imagine, is critical of education as well in a similar way to Marxists. So rather than education reinforcing capitalism, it's reinforcing patriarchy. So this is all for it seen through gender role socialization, gender scripts, gender domains, double standards, the male gaze. So there's a lot of stuff happening that has disadvantaged girls in education. There's lots of connections to gender and DA. They, these two topics quite heavily overlap. Um, and it's also quite interesting to sort of think about the idea that it highlights the inequality faced by women in public and education. One of the things that feminism can be criticised for doing is obviously ignoring a lot of the gains that girls have made in the education system and that there is a greater sense of equality. I'm not saying it's fully equal, but there's a greater equality. Also in terms of achievement, girls have outperformed boys in every subject, in every level since 1989. So there is this big kind of area that doesn't seem to be recognized or, or isn't you know highlighted as often by feminism to show that there has been significant gains in education so the key feminists we have we've got brown and ross who talk about the gender domains in education the division between boys and girls and dividing tasks into the male and the female uh, we've got Weiner, who talks about describing education as a woman free zone and we've got just statistics, so social policies like Education Reform Act, Sexual Discrimination Act, e, uh, Equality Pay Act, just and wise, all, again, have these connections. They're not feminists, but they're policies that link to feminism and have a, a big role to play. Social action theory talks about, uh, obviously, these micro approaches, the small scale. It's what is happening in the education system, in the classroom with the students. So it's all about those interactions. So it can be positive and negative. It highlights issues of labeling, subcultures. Um, 
and particularly if you look at the work of Sewell, the different types of, of labelling that can be applied to um, to boys from ethnic minority groups, or in his case, he talked about black boys. So conformist, innovators, rebels, retreatists in his work. And again, it's really influential for looking at education from a different point of view. Everything and all the other thinkers to date and so far have always taken that big macro. This is what happens and generalises it to all. So it is a very small scale argument, particularly thinking about how we are affected by education. In interactionism, two key thinkers, we've got Rosenvall and Jacobson. So labelling, self-fulfilling prophecy is a real key area of interactionism. Sewell, as I mentioned, the different types of pupil subcultures that he observed, and also like Rutter. Oh, we haven't got Rutter on here, but Rutter's really good. He talks about how we spend 15,000 hours in education and how important the experience of education is. But here we've got Ball talking about banding, labelling and differentiation. So kind of a bit of an extension of Rosenfeld and Jacobson. And last but not least, theory-wise, we have postmodernism. Now, just like social action, which I didn't flag up, postmodernism and social action, they do not have a view on whether education is good or bad. They simply study what it is. So social action is studying from the micro level. Postmodernism is studying education in the postmodern era. So since the 1980s, we are in the postmodern era and they're looking at education in a period of time. So they say that we have the choice, diversity, flexibility. We've become fragmented so we can choose and pick and choose education system to suit our needs. And really what they would highlight is the diversity of education systems and teaching styles, but also the impact of technology, particularly ironically, as we're talking about this video, the, you know, the way that teaching has changed because technology has changed. So key posts on this, you've got Thompson, who talks about the one size fits all approach to education being outdated. Um, and we should highlight this opportunity for customization in terms of maybe assessment, teaching styles, delivery of the course, um, you know, flexibility in how you learn. And then we've also got Usher, who identifies the characteristics of education in the postmodern era. So again, being characterized by being diverse, being flexible, that learning is a lifelong process and active learners are obviously really key in his view. Okay, and, and we hit the last little stretch here. So class and DA or DA generally. So what I've got here is just indicating that when it comes to DEA and class, gender, ethnicity, you've got the external, which is outside of school factors, and the internal, which is happening inside the education system. Now, when it comes to this topic, there is a massive amount of overlap. So particularly, a lot of the factors we're seeing in ethnicity are a repetition of what we see in class, um, particularly was when we took ethnic minority groups. Uh, you know, ethnic minority groups tend to be, not all exclusively, but tend to be it's either comes down to whether they're working class, ethnic minority groups, or they're middle class. And again, a lot of these factors overlap. So when it comes to class on its own, outside of school, we've got material deprivation, cultural deprivation, cultural capital or capitals, and what Bourdieu referred to as habitus, and marketization policies. So lacking money, lacking norms, values, and skills, or, or awareness of cultural values, cultural capital or the habitus, would be lacking money, educational qualifications, social contacts and knowledge. And in marketization is about parents choosing their education and being able to afford the best schools. Inside school, labeling is happening, subcultures and streaming, the policies of marketization and marketization policies, same point as first. But all of this is happening and all these things combined, so outside and inside school. And then again, you can take some time to look at the screen where I've just identified some of the factors and key thinkers associated with it. DNA ethnicity is the same as I mentioned, it's material deprivation, cultural deprivation, just like in class. Policies of marketization have the same impact. The new addition here is racism. So the influence of racism, which in turn causes material deprivation uh, and cultural deprivation because of lack of uh, employment opportunities um, which kind of disadvantage these students. Inside school, same as class, labelling, pupil subcultures, the different areas would be institutional racism, 
within education and also pupils class identity so the students identity self identity being influenced by their ethnicity and class and often these clash with the the values within education and that can cause barriers to learning again as you can see here just some of those key thinkers just indicating the external and the internal what you will notice if, as i've mentioned several times is a lot of these thinkers are the same for social classes the same people the same theory it's just being applied in a different way and last but not least we get to gender and da now gender and da is a bigger topic because we're looking at two social groups whereas in the uh, class and uh, gen uh, ethnicity we just say this group suffer this this group don't with gender there's two completely different sets of ideas girls in terms of external factors there's been changes in employment changes in the media changes in ambitions and changes to family all of these have benefited girls and their education for boys outside of school change of employment in the same sense that you know there's been a decline in employment socialization and literacy is is different for boys so boys aren't always encouraged to read there's more socialization pushing towards activity being aggressive being competitive which doesn't sit well with education and also changes to family structures the role of women in families the change in family values you know it's a push towards more equality and away from those traditional gender roles inside education we've got GCSEs and coursework. Uh, now, for girls, coursework was a massive advantage. It, girls are better at coursework because they spend more time and effort on them. The recent policy of scaling back coursework could lower or reduce the gap between boys and girls, but in a way of capping the girls' achievement rather than raising the boys' achievement. More female teachers is beneficial for girls. Stereotypes are being challenged and marketization. At schools would prefer to have girls. Girls get better grades. So in terms of marketization and making money through good grades, schools are going to want to pick girls more. Inside school for boys, feminization of education, lack of male role models was the opposite effect that the girls are seeing. The laddish, laddish subcultures again challenge or go against the values of education and marketization. Schools would prefer girls. Girls get get better grades boys don't get as good grades so they're not going to be you know the, the the sort of the key pupils they want to get in first and again bigger table here with some of those key concepts some of the key thinkers again you can take this table and you can add to it and develop it but this is a very brief overview and the question combination so last but not least da questions are tricky because there's a lot of content, but the combination of questions can just be so extensive. So you can see in each column, you've got class questions, ethnicity questions, and gender questions. Now the questions could be, why is it a working class underachieve? Why do they underachieve externally or underachieve internally? Why did the middle class achieve? Is it external, is it internal? Well, you could get a question just ask for social class differences. So you've got to cover the difference between working and middle class in and out or it might just be specific as in and out but both social classes and you can see this pattern repeat so ethnicity underachievement is it external is it internal what is achievement so you've got to cover quite a lot there um, it could be is it external is it internal again differences so the question and the wording can be quite broad in terms of focus on the work underachievers focus on all of the students focus on the overachievers is it internal is it external what is going on and then for gender again same thing boys girls in out good bad difference underachievement or if that's not enough you can get those really annoying questions where it's social groups and achievement difference internal where it's not just what's the difference between each social group but you've got to cover class ethnicity and gender in one 30 mark essay so i know it's a lot there it gives you so much to write but it can be tricky in the sense it's giving you too much to write 
And there we have it. So that's the whole of the education topic, very, very briefly summed up in, in just under 30 minutes. As I said, it's a very brief overview. It's not extensive. You need to go back and do the revision and studying yourself. But hopefully, just to kind of overview what you've covered, this might help. Okay, so thanks for watching. And we'll see, hopefully you found this helpful.